A former Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice, Mohamed Adoke, recently stated that the administration of Buhari was the, and I quote, most incompetent Nigeria ever had, saying was run by, and I quote, a set of political morons, end of quote. In a pushback to the position of justice, Adoke, former President Muhammad Buhari has said his administration saved Nigeria from corrupt undertones planted to expose the nation's economy to collapse. In a statement by Buhari's former spokesman, Garba Shehu, who replied to Adoke over cases involving Process and Industrial Development, PNID, Paris Club, and the Ajao Kuta Steel Company, he said Buhari's success in the fight against corruption was unprecedented. According to him, Buhari's administration inherited the contract and incidental judgment in the PNID, adding that the cases identified by Adoke originated from an administration that the former attorney general was part of. Let me quote him. The logical conclusion any reasonable person can draw on PNID, Paris Club and Ajao Kuta is that President Buhari came on a rescue mission and effectively saved Nigeria from corrupt undertones that were planted to expose its economy to imminent collapse. End of quote. All right. So, Rufai, I'm sure you probably have seen or, um, you know, watched that explosive interview with um, former Attorney General of the Federation, mm. Mr. Doke, and we're expecting a response. Mr. Garba Shou, former spokesperson to the President, um, President Mohamed Buhari, has responded. Your take on the story. So, uh, Mr. Doke did make his position known in an interview, I think probably with um, Adesua and... Um, Adesua Giwa Osage. Giwa Osage, yeah. And um, in that interview, he said a lot. And we all remember the back and forth of what, you know, Mr. Adoki had gone through prior to this time. And he talked about the massive level of corruption. But Mr. Gaba, she also retorted by saying, oh, we did a lot, you know, to stem the type of corruption. And in all fairness, the case of PNID that Mr. Gaba, she was started is spot on. Because we could have paid that judgment debt. But apart from PNID, there are many other judgment debts that are creeping up us that we don't even talk about again. It was because that bubbled up to the surface and we made a very good investigation as regards it, and that case is still on for a bit. But apart from P and ID and other cases, there were other massive cases of corruption that the President Muhammad Buhari administration needs to account for. Number one question would be, how did he spend, that administration spend the over 20 trillion printed by the central bank that has put us in this debt quagmire as we speak today? Because if you do a cost-benefit analysis of the so-called infrastructure done with the money spent and the level of humongous debts, then the Buhari administration have a lot of questions to answer. I mean, we are still talking about the case of Nigerian air, Addis Erika. We are still talking about many other cases of non prosecute. I remember the case of Goje when he was running for Senate and uh, President Buhari also, I think the, the government had an interest in who was going to become Senate president then. And all of a sudden, they declared the case of non prosecute the Attorney General. Another massive case of corruption here and there. Yes, the Buhari administration might have done something to stand the time of PNID and saved Nigeria from that because that was a humongous judgment debt. But what are the other cases of corruption and what are the other levels of accountability they need to give to Nigerians? Because when you look at it on the whole, there's a big question around cost-benefit analysis. So if you say we are topped the debts from the time of Good Luck Jonathan, what did we spend the money on? A lot of people will also say there's been a massive level of mismanagement of the economy. I will show you an interesting stat, a comparative stat that is making the rounds again now. And it just shows you how dire things are under President Muhammad Buhari or things were under President Muhammad Buhari. President Goodluck Jonathan in 2010 grew the economy by 8%, 2011, 5%, uh, 2012, 4.3%, 2013, 6.67%, 2014, 6.31%. President Muhammad Buhari, the economy grew 2.65% in 2015. 2016, we had gone into a recession minus 1.62%. 2017, 0.81%. 2018, 1.92%. 2019, 2.21%. 2020, again, minus 1.79%. You could probably say, okay, COVID induced. Then 2021, 3.65%. 2022, 
You want to also compare that with an Olusha Gwamba that 1999, okay, 0.58%, but 2002, it grew 15.33% the economy. So these are the data and the stats there. But yes, Sagarabashi was spot on in his defense by talking about the PI, PNID that the case really, yes, they intervened and they saved Nigeria. But what are the, what of the other pieces of accountability that are still hanging around the administration? Thank you. Okay. okay. <clears throat> what is the background to all of this? Mohamed Adoke, Mohamed Bello Adoke turned 60. He's 60 years old and he granted an interview to a young lady called Adesua Bello Osage. Uh, uh, Giwa Osagi, in which he made the allegation that the Buhari administration, in his own estimation, is the most incompetent administration that ever showed up in the history of Nigeria. And that it was a, an administration that was run by political morons, to be specific. Those are his words quoting him. And he said it was also a very corrupt administration. Well, Mohamed Belo Adoke served Nigeria uh, 2010 to 2015 as Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice. He also has the title of a commander of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. But as it turned out, he was one of those persons who were targeted after the exit of the, Buhari of the uh, Jonathan administration in 2015. He had to go on exile. Then, of course, in the course of his sojourn in exile, he wrote a book called The Burden, the Burden of Service, which was published, I think, 2018, 2019. I remember doing a, a full page, back page review of that book on the back page of uh, this day newspaper. And what is his argument in that book? He simply responded to all the allegations against him because he was taken to court on the basis of a number of issues. OPL 245, which refers to Malabu oil, in which he argues in the book that in fact, contrary to allegations against him, he helped Nigeria to save money because the advice that he gave the president was on the basis of protecting the rule of law. And that whatever else he might have done in that regard with Malabu oil was with regard to the powers of the president under section five of the constitution. I recall that maybe I wrote another piece on that trying to explain the exact meaning of section five of the 1999 constitution within the context of that. He also responded in that book to the Ajaokuta steel issue. You know, all the judgment debts and all that and talked about reform, particularly with regard about how you know, uh, judgment debts have been used to perpetrate corruption, uh, you know, within the Ministry of Justice, and now he had tried uh, to check uh, all of that. Now, what is the other issue? The PNID. The PNID also that came up in several interviews, he had also spoken about this, how, you know, whatever he did as Attorney General was in the best interest of Nigeria and in line with the functions of the Office of the Attorney General of Justice as the Chief Law Officer of the Federation. But now on the occasion of his uh, 60th uh, birthday, the same issues have come up again. And he had reached his own conclusion that uh, Buhari's administration can best be classified as the most incompetent in the history of Nigeria because it was run by political morons. Okay. Some people may say this is sour grapes. Some people may say, well, he's entitled to his own opinion. But the truth of the matter is that there are different opinions out there about the performance of the Buhari administration. So that's the background to all of this. Before we go to the other side of it, let's congratulate Mohamed Bello Adoke on the occasion of his uh, 60th uh, birthday. I understand he's a grandfather now. It's not easy to be a grandfather in this country of vipers and serpents and all kinds of afflictions, you know, imposed by circumstances and also by human beings on anybody who is trying to make a headway in this country. But that is an aside. Now, Garu Bashew, who seems to have remained actively on duty for President uh, Mohamed Buhari, has now come forward to say he disagrees with uh, Mohamed Belouad, okay? And that if anything, what President Mohamed Buhari did 
was to check corruption, to save Nigeria from the uh, affliction of corruption that had been imposed on it by the uh, Jonathan administration, under which Mohamed Adoke was, uh, was uh, Attorney General and Minister of Justice. Okay, two sides of the same, of, 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 of the same coin. Okay, uh, Garubashiu still on duty, defending his principal. You may say out of loyalty, he's still doing that. I don't know why he has not moved on to something else. When people leave office, they should find something else to do. You don't just stay on one spot and you keep gyrating like a yo-yo, you know, bouncing up and down on the same spot. But I don't know the nature of his engagement with uh, President Buhari. But he says the Buhari government fought corruption and checked corruption. Okay, other people have different opinions. Apart from uh, Mohamed Bello Adoke, uh, you know, uh, there are other people who say, well, corruption got worse under President Buhari. After all, the tripodial proposition that he uh, put before Nigerians was economy, security, checking corruption. The, the, the popular opinion out there is that the administration did not do anything about corruption. You have the uh, same uh, uh, Tinubu administration, which is an APC to APC administration, appointing a special investigator to look into some of the affairs of the Buhari administration. You have principal officials in the uh, uh, Buhari administration that have been taken in and detained, interrogated by the Tinumbu administration. We had recently Wale Edu, who is uh, Minister of Finance and uh, Coordinating Minister of the Economy, an APC chieftain, in, in a sense, who has also come out publicly to say that uh, the Buhari administration ran the Nigerian economy aground. That's not uh, Belu Adoke, that's uh, Wali Edun, their own Wali Edun, condemning them. So there's a lot to this matter, and people should just not be emotional about it. You know, you can say people are entitled to their views, but the truth about, you know, the Buhari administration will still be out there. Would the Tinubu administration have the courage to dig deep and find out? After all, they've been saying so much happened with uh, uh, forced subsidy. Now they are risking it. After all, they said so much happened with Anko Borowa's program. We, they are investigating. The same Tinumbu administration is asking questions about what was done with uh, money for palliatives during COVID-19. So this should not be personalized. It should not be Garuba Shehu versus uh, uh, Belo Adoke. And Belo Adoke has thrown into the mix some interesting mix that uh, uh, Mr. Ibrahim Mago, former ESCC chairman, in fact, had to apologize to him. And he had also been uh, vindicated by the commercial court in the UK. The commercial court in the UK said Mohamed Adoke had no, nothing to respond to with regard to OPL 245. Similarly, a court in Italy that was uh, investigating ENI and uh, Total and all of that also said, Mohamed Adoke had no case to answer. So if a Mohamed Adoke now turns around and he says he was being victimized, he was being uh, maligned unduly, then he probably has a basis for it. But uh, uh, out of office, Garubashi still has to eat. He still has to be seen to be doing his job. You know, all of us are human beings. When you uh, wake up in the morning, you still need oxygen. So you have to do work. Another, but at the end of the day, discerning members of uh, our community, reasonable members of our community, will be able to look at all the various strands of the matter and be able to say perhaps this is where the truth lies. So essentially, every government will be reviewed in and out of office, and the jury is still out in this particular regard, it seems to me. All right, so very quickly, um, the big question would be, as has already been asked, since um, the last of the eight-point agenda of President Bola Tinubu was announced during the first Federal Executive Council meeting was anti-corruption. And so the question had been asked again and again that would he be courageous enough, would he have the boldness to probe the activities of the previous administration, which a number of independent um, reports have tagged it as 
fantastically corrupt. So when you look at the US country reports on human rights practices, Transparency International, they have released reports um, judging the Buhari administration as being very corrupt. As has been said, um, we didn't expect any different from Balam Gabashiro in saying that oh, the, um, the, um, President Buhari saved Nigeria from graft. A few questions and a few um, things that he still needs to answer, and perhaps I would give more light to his claim that President Buhari, fulfilling his campaign promise, according to Malam Gabashiro, who fought corruption during his eight years in office. The first thing is that what has happened to the um, investigation around the former Accountant General of the, of the Federation, Ahmed Idris, with 109 billion naira under the President Buhari administration. We have um, monies allocated to the um, you know, turnaround maintenance of the refineries. Eight years, refineries didn't work. The four refineries didn't work. We look at this, um, the racketeering and the rent seeking with fuel subsidy. Or eight years under the President Buhari administration, that is still a question to answer. A number of schemes, school feeding scheme, remember that they said they sent billions of naira during COVID-19 when students were in school, feeding school children. Until now, despite invitations by the House of Representatives, no, um, there's been no accounting for it. We don't know who um, the children were feeding in school during COVID-19. We have programs that are shrouded under a bit of you know, secrecy in terms of transparency in spending, like NPower. Um, we have um, um, the programs like Trader Money. These, th these programs and schemes were said to also have been greatly corrupt. Also, we look at um, ministries and ministers who came under um, challenges of corruption or allegations of corruption under the same President Buhari administration. Remember the case of the Minister of Education, Malam Adamu Adamu. Remember the case of the Minister of Health in terms of um, um, cash um, flowing back to um, you know, being, um, being bribed by their underlings and cases that have still remained on, you know, remained on, you know, under investigated. Nothing has come out of it, no investigation. All we know is that money is missing, things are not adding up, and corruption reigns supreme under the administration that promised Nigeria during its campaign that it was going to fight corruption. It was going to wield the big stick against corruption. Unfortunately, this, isn't, this didn't quite happen. The same with the PNID. Even though Malangaba Show is, is isolating that, but to be fair to Nigerians, it's time to tell the truth. I doubt very much if President Bola Tinubu will probe the previous administration, maybe a few um, you know, ministries here and there. But the reason why it's important to look back is so that we can learn certain lessons. And we've always talked about strengthening institutions. Um, President um, uh, Olusha Gwabasanjo had come out recently to say that ministers under his administration were not allowed to approve certain amounts of money above a threshold. We need to put systems in place to prevent MDAs from being a reign of corruption and individuals amassing wealth when they are supposed to be serving the people. President Buhari's tenure was not anti graft did not fight corruption. In fact, corruption reigned. Moving on to our next story, President Bola Tinubu will depart from Abuja today to attend the G20 summit in New Delhi, India from September 9 to 10. Ajuri Ingalali, presidential spokesperson, says Nigeria is exploring G20 membership after assessing the potential risks and benefits. South Africa is the only African member among the world's top, top 20 industrialized nations. During the summit, President Tinubu will participate in the Nigeria-India Presidential Roundtable and Business Conference, aiming to attract global investment and discuss his renewed hope agenda for economic reform. He will also hold private meetings with industrialists and world leaders to strengthen economic partnerships. The president will be joined by key cabinet members for the G20 summit in India, including the ministers of foreign affairs, finance, communications and industry, and will return to Nigeria after the summit. President Tinubu goes to the G20 summit. We're fine. Okay. The thing about the summit is it's also a good gathering place to be able to meet a lot of people. And also on the silence of the G20 summit, there's something called the Business 20, you know, where you have uh, people uh, that talk about, you know, business. Uh, Tony, Tony Lewilly is co-chair for that. The metals are also on that. It's also about business. But part of this delegation that the business leaders president, Tony is taking, I'd like to ask, did we even have any meeting prior to this time with them before we decided to say, let's go for the G20 summit? Because we must have a convergence of efforts and thought process. Secondly, 
What is the KPI set out by this administration as regards going to the G20? Yeah, there are talks about joining the G20. What is the KPI set up? What do we need? What do we need from India? India has a lot of advancement in science and technology. You saw what they just launched to the, uh, to the space now. India has a lot of advancement in pharmaceuticals. And that's why we had a port period of business owners. That's good. But did we talk internally and say, okay, these are the things you should be required from India? If we didn't do that, it's bad. Because we need to have that meeting internally with our business leaders. And also, it's not just only G20 meeting, but also a periodic meeting. It's not going to be bad if we have periodic convergence with business leaders cross-sectorally with the president to be able to itemize the need in the sector. So that is of importance at first before we go out there. Then how can we tap into this, apart from India, but from other G20 nations? And to look at possibilities as which you can grow our economy. Because the priority here should be symbiotic development of economies around the world. And see how we can tap into the resource base. There's something called friend sharing, where people you are affiliated to help you boost your economy when you are down. Example is what happened to Russia. Russia enjoyed it when the Ukraine war started, when other parts of the West were not ready to buy their oil. But guess what was happening? India was still buying their oil big time. China was still buying their oil big time. Over the years, North Korea still enjoyed the fact that China buys most of its produce. Or, I mean, materials and things like that to be able to show up the economy of North Korea. So, what can we benefit from the G20? And most importantly, we have a big revenue problem. Most of the countries we are going to meet there, we have huge trade deficits with them. How can we grow trade? How can we have value-added industries? Those are the conversation we should be having in G20. Because President Tinobu's greatest task is how to show up revenue. All the problems we keep shouting that we don't have money. If we have a revenue base of over $100 billion governmental revenue year on year, the country will leap. Okay, this is the, um, you know, um, the second um, G20 summit. After the last one in uh, Bali, Indonesia, in November 2022, which provided an opportunity for President Biden and President Xi Jinping to meet on the sidelines of that summit. This year's uh, G20 summit in India is also coming against the background of the recent uh, BRICS summit in uh, South Africa. So that gives it a certain significance in terms of the thematic focus. India is hoping that with this G20 summit, it will be able to further you know, solidify on its aspirations uh, as the next major economy in the world. So the theme is about one earth, one humanity, and all of that. So within the context of one humanity and all of that, you have these other countries being invited on the sidelines. Let nobody be fooled. The major issues at this G20 summit that will start on September 9, that President Tinumbu will leave, uh, will depart to go and attend today, you know, is about the Russian-Ukraine war. It's about commercial relations, economic relations between Russia and, uh, between China and the United States. The president of the U.S. will probably be there, but Xi Jinping is not, will not be there. The premier of China, you know, uh, Li Qiang, uh, is the one who is going to be uh, uh, there. The Russian president will not be there. He's sending Sergei, the uh, uh, Russian uh, foreign affairs uh, uh, minister. But these three major players in the G20 will be part of the major issue. Another issue there will be oil and U.S. relations with the Middle East. Another major issue will be about climate, climate adaptation and all of that, and energy and all that. Okay, why have I identified the major thematic directions that will likely you know, uh, come up at this G20 summit just to show that Nigeria is saying we are going there, President Tinubu is going with four ministers, he's going with about 45 business people, all of these people will go with their own entourage and all of that. We don't have a seat in the room. This is the point. So, and it's a comment on where we are in the world. We're not part of G7. We're not part of G20. 
we go about saying Nigeria is the giant of uh, Africa. The last time President uh, Buhari attended, uh, was invited to the G7 meeting, he came up with a phenomenal statement about how the place for his wife is in the other room. That was a major contribution to a serious meeting in the world. This time around, we're saying is a, a Nigeria India Business Council uh, that is organizing a CEO roundtable, and uh, so many Nigerian CEOs are going up and down. They, they want to go to India as if they've never been there before. The president himself is saying he's going with uh, four ministers. Look, you can go there and have photo ops. The truth of the matter is that we're going there as the most populous country in Africa that will be there as a marginal player. And even if there are certain deals that are signed and all of that, look, it may amount to nothing. In any case, many of these things, they lack uh, follow-up uh, additives in terms of how our foreign policy process is structured. They go and sign some of these agreements, they say investment is coming. Is that how you bring investment to Nigeria? You want to go to uh, uh, India, Tomorrow you go to China, we go and bring uh, 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 investment. That's not how you bring uh, uh, investment. It's not through photo up opportunity. It's about turning Nigeria into a production hub, making sure that there is activity in this economy that will attract other people to say that Nigeria is an attractive investment destination. That is what the Nigerian government should be talking about. Yes, President Tinubu will go there, you know, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, those ones, they are committed to activity, not policy. They are always organizing activities. So they will get the president to shake some hands. I give it two, three days. By September 10, September 11, you see newspapers will hurry up and say, President Tinubu in a handshake with the president of... Those are meaningless things. If they don't translate into concrete deliverables, outcomes for Nigeria. So all this uh, fanfare, President Tinubu is going to India and all of that, please forget it. We have so many Indians here now who are doing business here. It's not as if they are going to go away at any particular time because Nigeria provides them an environment where they can make a lot of profit at the expense of uh, Nigerians. I hope one of the things they will discuss there will be head tourism between Nigeria and India and how many uh, privileged Nigerians are perpetually going to India on head tourism because the hospitals in Nigeria are not working. So, but we wait for the photo ops. We see the pictures. When the pictures begin to come out, you see ministers is shaking the hand of that minister. Okay, what comes after? So please, let's not get carried away. We need to rethink our foreign policy process, but it's not about the slogans that the presidency and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, what do they call it, the four Ds or whatever, people just come up with slogans that they don't even understand. Well, the G20 is made up of the 20 most advanced and biggest economies in the world. And so you would imagine that having South Africa as the only African country on, that, on, the, you know, on the platform is quite interesting, bearing in mind that Nigeria is a critical um, nation. The biggest economy in Africa, the most populous economy in Africa is not a member of that um, alliance because it's important to understand that when it comes to not just individuals, even at country level, your alliances are very important to your um, standing in you know, economic matters. We're not a member of BRICS, we're not a member of G20. And so this invitation by the um, Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi, is quite significant for Nigeria. And I think also it's important to note that the ministers that the president is going with are key. He's, in terms of the optics, the people who are going with him, they are instrumental in terms of economic policies. He has a minister of foreign affairs, he has a minister of finance and coordinating minister, minister of the economy. He has a minister of industry, trade and investment and the minister of um, um, Mr. Dr. Bosun Tijani, the Minister of um, the Digital Economy, quite important. He's also going with 38 private sector leaders. In fact, in terms of Nigeria's placing or our role at this particular summit is the fact that at the business sideline um, conversation of this G20 summit, we have one of our own, um, Mr. Tony Lumelu, co-chairing with Mr. Bharti of the Bharti Enterprises Worldwide. I think it's an opportunity for Nigeria to position itself, as Mr. Engelali said in that um, communique, as the destination for foreign investments, 
or in the investment desire of the world. If this isn't achieved, then as Dr. Abati has said, we are just going there for photo ops and to spend money that we can keep within our nation. Again, we'll continue to, this is a developing story, we'll definitely bring you updates from the G20 summit. I'll go on to our last story for today. It's a big one here, and we are celebrating at Arise News, as Arise News has won this year's Nigeria Achievers Award 2023. We have a plaque and we have a certificate. It goes to the best TV station of the year, and it goes to Arise News. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for Arise News. The award which held at the Grand Canyon in Lekki, Lagos, was a celebration of the achievements and societal development contributions of Nigerians, both locally and internationally, and for people living in Nigeria, irrespective of color and race. Arise News Channel, there we have Mr. Ozi Okoli, who is the producer of The Morning Show, uh, was represented, very well represented, and we are definitely happy to receive this award. We want to say a big thank you to Nigerian Achievers Award for these wonderful presenting. And uh, it shows that you are watching us. <laughs> and we will keep doing what we have to do best. To our chairman, our Prince Unduka Baibina, for his vision of Africa rises. And Africa will keep on rising. Thank you very much. It is good to know that we are people who are watchdog of the society, who can call the government, who can call individuals to order, and to celebrate people who are doing the right thing at the right time. So that was the reason why we chose Arise TV as the best TV of the of the best TV station of the year for their creativity and objectivity in delivering their journalism. It's amazing. Arise has um, has grown in leaps and bounds over the over the years. They've they've consistently shown that that greatness is in the hands of Nigerians. And um, with what they've done, I, I'm not surprised that they are winning. Congratulations, Arise News. It looks like this year is a winning year for us. And we are loving it. Right. A lot of awards, a lot of awards. Please keep it coming. We are taking everything. Certificate of honor. Please touch it, feel it, feel yes, it, feel it. It's our work. Cool. Certificate of honor. It's our work. Cool. Touch it, hard okay. work. As I keep saying, in this circumstance, you know, the awards keep coming, but people should not get carried away. Yes, yes, yes. yes. The reward for hard work is oh, more yeah. hard work, and people should not sleep on their own supply. Mm -hmm. Because we have been here, we have mm -hmm. seen in this place, at a time it was NTA, as I keep saying, at a time it was Silverbird, at a time it was Channels yeah. that dominated the space for 10 years, at a time it was uh, TVC. Now is the time of Arisenius. What it means, what these awards that keep coming from every direction, what they mean is simply that more hard work is required yeah. for us to stay in the front line and you know, for us to continue to sustain the trust of, uh, and the confidence of the viewers uh, whose solidarity, whose support, you know, uh, we seem to be the oxygen you know, that keeps us uh, going. Yeah. So, Complacency is not the answer to this. The only answer is continued hard work, dedication, professionalism, and realizing that this dream that has caught on has to be sustained, yes. whatever it takes. So let nobody get carried away to say, oh, it's a rise, it's a rise. No, we've seen so many seasons in this environment, and we just need to focus on the essentials. Thank you very much for the award, and thank you, viewers, for being there for us always.